friends, I'm uh, very happy to be the person that will, the, whose talk will clear the whole room. <laughs> okay. Now, when Mr. Raman asked me to uh, come and share some of our uh, machine perspectives uh, in this forum, I was a little ambivalent because a lot of automation really uh, contextually applies to big, you know, like what he mentioned, process plants and fertilizer plants and uh, continuous manufacturing plants. We come from the discrete manufacturing industry <clears throat> where the machines that we build typically tend to be standalone machines. They may be interconnected in some fashion, but they are largely standalone. There is a lot of automation that can go on inside the machines per se. Okay? So what I thought I would do is share a very small story about uh, what we have been doing how it plays into the emerging trends of what we're seeing in the market. So for those of you that uh, are not aware, is, uh, Ace Micromatic is actually a group of companies which uh, is currently India's leader in CNC machines and automation products. We are India's largest manufacturer in our space now, the industry itself, relatively, is a very small industry. But it is an industry with a very significant footprint and an impact. There is a 1 is to 100 capital gearing. For every rupee of CNC machine produ I mean, uh, purchased, there is about 100 rupees of economic value add produced. So it's a mother industry. And uh, as part of this industry, we've been very uh, fortunate to have played a a key role in actually pushing CNC in India. Uh, back in the early 80s is when uh, we started to produce our first uh, CNC machines and uh, we have played a significant part in you know, making sure that CNC technology really took root well in India. In addition to that, there is a software company in the group which again people are calling this manufacturing intelligence. Now, we didn't know what to call it when we started that in India, but we said let's help people uh, improve, you know, improve their productivity and profits on the shop floor. Okay. <clears throat> As a group, uh, we are about uh, 1,500 crores, 3,000 people, and uh, we believe that uh, we should be in the global top 10 in maybe not 2020, but perhaps uh, the recession having knocked off a couple of years but maybe by 22 or 23. Okay? That would place us in a vantage point uh, where, see if you looked at in the early 2000, there was no Indian company that was in the global top 100. We came into the global top 100 in the early 2000s. And then there's been a steady climb. We are right now around 50 or 51. And we believe that with a series of things that we are planning to do, we should be in the global top 10. And the way we have done that is the good old-fashioned, time-trusted way. We are a homegrown uh, set of companies, no technical collaboration with anybody. Everything is from scratch, and we continue to be that way. And uh, we, ha you know, we are very heavily centered on business ethics. Till date, I can proudly state that not a rupee or a paisa has been paid for anything not an electricity connection, not land acquisition, not anything, not orders definitely. Uh, also, it so happens that we have a very small share of our revenue coming from government and public sector. Okay. So the group has uh, five OEMs, and the, uh, there's a reason why I'm giving you this background. There are five OEMs, each focused on a particular uh, space of uh, product and uh, there's also half a dozen component manufacturing companies which are either tier ones or tier twos okay so the perspective that we bring is not only from india but we've also been a fairly successful exporter of what we do all around the world again i mean it's not a big uh, percentage of our revenue yet but uh, you know it's continuing to grow so the perspective that we bring is from the global uh, 
you know, footprint that we have, as well as an extensive pan-India footprint that we have, where pretty much almost 40 cities in India we operate, and we are able to promise our customers a mean time of just two hours to respond, which is a historical feat for our industry. We operate pretty much in the general engineering and automotive industry. For instance, in automotive, almost 70% of the turned parts in India are made on our machines. And in India, we have almost a 50% market share. The other 50%, there's about 75 competitors, both domestic and foreign. The, and I don't want to go into all this, we're all experiencing this. The bottom line is, manufacturers need to do something very different and very sustainable to even continue to grow with all the challenges that we have. The trends that we are seeing is, there is one set of requirements which is high volume. And in high volume, we are seeing an increasing uh, setup of flow line or single piece production where, you know, it could be conveyors, either manual or automated. Okay. We are also looking at trends where automation is brought in mainly for material handling. Right. But one thing is about automation. I know I'm not going to be very popular when I say this because it's supposed to be an automation forum. The one thing about automation is, unless there is a very strong control on input quality, you're only going to automate rejections. Yes? And that is one of the issues, as far as we are seeing in our space, in India and a lot of the emerging countries. For instance, I mean, you t take a raw material piece that comes in to get machined. If that raw material is off by even a, you know, say 10 microns or 20 microns, all the programming that is done goes for a toss. And you cannot automate that. That's where, when we look at automation in the discrete manufacturing industry, we need to go several steps backwards and make sure that our input quality is so well controlled that it lends itself to automation. Otherwise, you are only guaranteeing a lot of rejections. So, for instance, what we have done, we have recently commissioned a, a campus about uh, 30 kilometers from here, where we have set up what might be the most uh, modern foundry in India. Not the largest, but the most modern foundry. Because that's a very critical input for our machines. Though it appears on paper that the per ton cost is little higher than what it normally would be from a standard foundry, but the value addition more than takes care of that because we're able to do heat treatment and stress relieving and so many other processes that are important for a good quality product. And unless we do that, you cannot automate. Okay. The second trend that we are seeing, and some of the earlier speakers alluded to that, there's going to be a lot of uh, focus on batch production. And in batch production, there's a couple of paradigms. Where there are high accuracies required, there is a great deal of uh, attention paid to process capability. The right toolings, in-process gauging, metrology, uh, offsets, automated uh, closed loops, things of that nature, which inherently increases the process capability because you're only going to do one or two or five or ten parts. For example, one of our uh, component companies actually produces parts for the PSLV rockets. It's a very high... I mean, it's just, just, just one such part that's produced and you've got to get it right the first time. There is no second time. Okay? So that is one trend where there's very high accuracy is required. A lot of attention is paid to automation that increases the process capability of the process itself. Okay? The second aspect of that is where there is short lead times required. There is increasing requirement of uh, machines which can do multiple things in one setup. It could be a, a, a terminal center, 
it could be a FMS, a flexible manufacturing system, which can do drilling, milling, tapping, just about any kind of operation, just in one setup. The third is, again, people call it 3D printing, but it is really a manifestation of additive manufacturing, where things are deposited in layers. Right now, this is still limited to very esoteric situations or very low batch quantities or very high value addition. For example, uh, one of the trends is these kind of machines are actually put on oil rigs where in an oil rig if let's say a, a part gets buggered up to have a part flown out, get repaired or get a new part in itself takes a lot of time and money. So in such a case, even having a million dollar machine on an oil rig is well worth it because it pays itself you know, in a matter of a few years, right? But this is something that perhaps will be in contrast to requirements of high volume even as the years go by, okay? The fourth trend that we are seeing is an intense focus on shop floor productivity, which is again, manufacturing intelligence or whatever you want to call that, right? And of all these things, again, it's each of these is very large and deep topics. I cannot do justice in a few minutes. The one topic that I would like to perhaps touch upon is the last topic, which is how do you get shop floor productivity? And here, the results can be pretty dramatic. Somebody mentioned transformation, right? What we have seen on shop floors, discrete manufacturing shop floors, the true efficiencies can be as low as 30%. Even in companies which are supposed to be damn good and on paper, perhaps we might say 80%, 90%, whatever it is, right? And there's a reason for that. The reason is benchmarking is one of those things. And if you don't have the right tool, benchmarks, historical legacies will never get corrected, right? And perhaps some of the tools like what Siemens mentioned could be you know, useful in that direction from a benchmarking perspective. Some recent examples are, there's a company uh, in Chennai which has grown extremely well. I don't know how many of you are in the forging industry, anybody? Nobody in forging? They are one of the leaders in cold forge components. They export worldwide, they are a tier one supplier. When they set up their uh, new export plant, having used this technology on their machines earlier, they achieved 7,500 pieces in three shifts. After using this kind of technology and the analytics and all those things rigorously and taking care of the root cause issues, they're getting 13,000 in two shifts. And that's it. Is that a transformation or no? And what they've done is OPEX of third shift is gone because the third shift doesn't exist anymore. Right? There's another company in uh, Pune. Some of you from Pune. Huh? Again, they're a good tier one. It's not that they don't know the business. They were producing something like that in three shifts. And they've improved by almost 25-30%. This is the kind of transformation that is going to drive the competitiveness of our industry. And this is what's going to aid in getting our manufacturing GDP to 25%. And the real growth rates of manufacturing has got to be closer to 15% to achieve that. And the only way to achieve that is greater competitiveness. And we are starting to see this trend happen where a lot of companies used to get certain parts from China initially. We are seeing, especially in the last one year, some of those parts are coming back to India. Okay? And we're very happy to see that. And what's aiding that is really the confidence of our companies to really raise their game in doing this kind of things, okay? And we are playing a small part in helping them with our solutions, okay? So what we are doing, <coughs> in, I think we are all uh, experts in understanding this and uh, essentially we need to horizontally deploy best practices as a DNA of a company. And for that, the part that we play is in the black hole in the middle, which is not touched by 
PLM, PDM, ERP, any of those things. And that would really connect the shop floor to the top floor, finally. Okay? So there's a suite of uh, products that we bring to the table for this. Uh, What we do is from virtually any asset on the shop floor, we uh, using a variety of data acquisition techniques, some sensory, some non-sensory, some agent based, we collect all this data into a central server, which is the data collection analytics engine and distributes the data out to whatever processes or systems require the data. Okay. <coughs> And as part of this, we look at several analytics. And this is really very specific stuff. This is not high level, this is not uh, theory. This is, you do this, I mean, you see this, you do this, you get this. Okay? So this is what we've been doing in one of those areas of the emergent trends that we're seeing. I'd like to stop here, we're still about five minutes left. And I'm very happy to be the person whose talks cleared this room. Okay? Thank you.